All right, we are back with episode two of my blind review of the One Piece manga. And let me say off the bat that I apologize for the technical difficulties with episode one. There were a lot of effects that did not work properly and some audio cutting issues. But bear with me as I'm using a new editing software, so there are going to be some kinks along the way that I'm going to work through. Anyways, we get to meet a clown, a lion, and an acrobat in this episode. So let's go ahead and jump right into One Piece Volume 2, Buggy the Clown, featuring chapters 9 through 17. Part 1, Nami and Buggy. This will cover chapters 9 through 11. Most of this volume revolves around the introductions of two key characters, Nami and Buggy. And since I didn't talk about Nami in the last episode, let's discuss her now. Nami is somebody that works in a very interesting way. We learn a lot about her, but we're also left with a ton of questions. For example, our first interaction with Nami is her tricking members of Buggy's pirate crew in order to steal their ship, conveying to the audience that Nami is quick-witted, intelligent, and is great at observing and surveying situations. The skill of surveying is something that we see Nami put to good use multiple times in the opening of the volume. Using this to capture Luffy in order to escape Buggy, calculating what she needs to do to get on Buggy's good side and also recover the Grand Line map, but also noticing that Luffy is very protective of his straw hat. I want to talk about this here during the Nami discussion as it sets up another major theme that we will be keeping track of moving forward in the story. Luffy is motivated by achieving his dream, and helping his friends achieve their dreams as we found out in the last volume, but also takes pride in what people hold as their treasure. Luffy considers the straw hat given to him by Shanks to be his treasure, placing personal value on it that Nami can't seem to fathom, since the hat doesn't contain the Grand Line map, and also doesn't contain any gold or currency that would be valuable to her. As you will see later on in this very video, the idea of protecting one's treasure is something that Luffy holds dear. Now back to Nami, and more specifically, the unanswered question she leaves us with. Nami mentions that she won't join Luffy's crew because she hates pirates, because pirates have taken something from her in the past, and now she is attempting to get enough money to buy back a certain village. These seeds of foreshadowing convey to the audience that there is much more to Nami than we have seen so far, and there is likely a scar from her past that is yet to be healed. This is also shown through her freezing up and she is told to kill Luffy using the Buggy Ball. Instructed by Buggy the Clown. Now, let's talk about the Clown Prince of Pirates himself, Buggy. I want to mention that Buggy and Alvita share a lot of characteristics right from the jump. You see that Buggy leads with fear, another pirate captain sharply contrasted to that of Shanks, but we also see that Buggy is self-conscious, and insecure about a particular feature of his body. His nose. Yep, that's right, his nose. Similarly to Alvita constantly seeking reaffirmation about how she is the fairest in all the seas, Buggy freaks out at the mention of his nose, and if you're foolish enough to bring it up, there are dire consequences. Now, I know you probably want me to mention and bring up how Zoro shows up and saves Luffy from Buggy and all that, and I'll be discussing Zoro later in the video, don't get me wrong, because dear lord, this volume takes Zoro to the next level. But the last thing I want to mention about Buggy is that he is the second ever character we see have a Devil Fruit ability, his being the Chop Chop Fruit, which allows Buggy to separate his body to avoid being cut. This is how Buggy gets the upper hand on Zoro, stabbing him as he and Nami run away, setting up the most touching story we have seen so far. Part 2, Shoo Shoo the Dog this will cover chapters 12 through 14. Setting the scene for what is about to happen, we find Zoro bleeding out from the attack by Buggy, Luffy still locked in the cage, and Nami with the key in hand as they make their way to a food store, with the little dog standing out front. The story takes a turn when this little dog eats the key to Luffy's cage, prompting Luffy to strangle the dog as the mayor of Orange Town, Boodle, yes, I'm not making this up, my boy's name is Boodle, tells the story of the dog, and what happens next is truly gut-wrenching. We find out that the little dog named Shoo Shoo was a pet of the man who used to own the dog food store. The man worked extremely hard to run the store, but unfortunately, he was plagued with a sickness that caused him to go to the hospital. While there, the man died. The final word Shoo Shoo hearing from his master was to guard the store while he was gone. Boodle reveals that this happened three months ago, but Shoo Shoo has remained vigilant protecting the store with all he can. This is when Boodle reveals that the store is Shushu's treasure, something Luffy takes note of 
as Moji the Beast Tamer arrives on the scene. I want to quickly mention how cool I thought it was that Oda made Buggy's crew reflect their captain, having Moji, the first mate of Buggy, have the gimmick of a Beast Tamer, another circus pun that plays into Buggy's trope as well. This is also where we get a quick flash of genius from Luffy, using the powerful strike of the lion Richie to escape from the cage, but this does not prevent the tragedy of what occurs next. We see Moji and Richie completely overpower Shushu, who desperately attempts to fight the duo, but to no avail. Moji setting the shop up in flames, destroying the very thing Shushu held dear to him. A heartbreaking scene that Luffy notices. This leads Luffy to confront Moji and Richie, and while you might think that fighting a lion would be a one-sided affair, Luffy handles these two in short order. When the fighting ends, we see Luffy return to Shushu and gives him the last remaining bag of dog food, and apologizes that he couldn't do more to save the shop, and also expresses his admiration to the dog for his courage. Nami notices this, and is shocked by the kindness Luffy showed to the little dog. But I want to make this clear. Luffy wasn't acting out of kindness, but rather out of his moral code. The dog had his treasure taken away, and Luffy acted to step in and defend the dog's honor when the dog couldn't, showing us that once again, Luffy values what others treasure. Something we see again when Boodle exclaims his love for Orangetown, after it is ravaged by a buggy ball, leading us to the final part of Volume 2. His name is Luffy! That's Monkey D. Luffy! King of the Pirates! He's made a robot! Part 3, Zoro vs. Kabaji. This will cover chapters 15 through 17. There are a lot of moving parts that I have not highlighted so far, such as Luffy's attempts to get Nami to join his crew, but paramount among them being Zoro. And that is because the ending of the volume is his time to shine. We have learned a lot about Zoro so far in this volume. We have seen his strength as he's able to carry Luffy locked in a cage to safety, and also his unique way of recovering, needing only to sleep in order to heal his wounds but also his resilience. And along with this, we also see his respect towards Luffy as his captain. In chapter 15, we see Luffy use the gum gum balloon to send a buggy ball flying back at Buggy and his crew. It is here that we see Buggy using his men as human shields and Kabaji using Richie as his own shield, much to the dismay of Moji. Buggy has zero respect for his crew and even allowed the pet of his first mate to be used as a shield. Buggy and his first mate clearly do not see eye to eye, it is clear that Buggy views himself to be more important than Moji, something that is sharply contrasted with the relationship between Luffy and Zoro. Zoro goes to fight Kabaji, and even after Luffy expresses his concerns about the undertaking, he stops when Zoro makes it clear that he wants to fight. Luffy does not interfere, because he trusts Zoro and knows that Zoro will win, but also that Zoro will not go above what he knows he's capable of doing. Conversely, Buggy attempts to sway the fight in favor of Kabaji by immobilizing Zoro. This is the only time that Luffy gets involved with the fight whatsoever, to prevent Buggy from interfering with his friend. Now, about the fight itself, we see Kabaji repeatedly attacking Zoro's injured side and gains the upper hand before Zoro reminds us of why he is the coolest swordsman around. Zoro slices his own body, telling Kabaji that he will be the world's greatest swordsman. And if he loses to someone like Kabaji with what he describes as a light wound, then he is not worthy to hold such a title. I mean, talk about a mic drop moment. I know Zoro has cool moments, but this is by far one of the best moments of the series so far. Once Zoro does this, the fight is basically over, with Zoro finishing Kabaji with his signature move, Onagiri, and lies on the ground to sleep again, as the volume ends setting up something major, as it is revealed that Buggy knows none other than Red Hair Shanks. But that does it for episode two, guys. Again, we're going to see how the next few episodes go. I might combine multiple volumes into one episode moving forward. But again, we'll just see how these episodes start going and what you guys want. So if you have any strong thoughts on that, leave them in the comments below. Regardless, make sure to subscribe, join the Discord down below so you can participate in community events such as One Piece Friday. And stay tuned for episode three coming very soon. I will see you all then.